More Africans than Europeans were transported to the Western Hemisphere in the first four centuries after Columbus. As of 1820, there had been nearly half again as many Africans as Europeans transported to the Spanish colonies of Latin America, nearly six times as many Africans as Europeans transported to Brazil, and about eight times as many Africans as Europeans transported to the West Indian colonies of Britain, France, Holland, and Denmark. The United States was an exception, but even here the white majority who migrated to the New World outnumbered the blacks transported involuntarily by less than twenty percent. For the Western Hemisphere as a whole, about four times as many Africans as Europeans arrived in the period up to 1820. However, because of the far higher mortality rates among the slaves, whose numbers could be maintained in most of the hemisphere only by continuing large-scale importations, migration statistics did not match the statistics on the respective resident black and white populations as of a given time. Thus, the resident white population in the United States in 1820 outnumbered the resident black population by more than four to one. In most of the rest of the Western Hemisphere, people of African ancestry still outnumbered people of European ancestry, though not by as wide a margin as among those transported. Over time, rising European immigration and a declining slave trade from Africa changed the demographic picture dramatically. By 1835, the resident white population of the Americas was more than double that of the resident black population. The formal banning of the international slave trade by Great Britain in 1808 did not immediately end the shipment of slaves across the Atlantic. Indeed, it was 1831 before the number of Europeans coming to the Western Hemisphere in a given year exceeded the number of Africans. From that point on, however, the number of slaves transported drifted slowly downward and then dropped precipitously in the 1850s. Conversely, the number of European immigrants rose dramatically exceeding the Africans by nearly one-fifth in the 1830s, by four-fifths in the 1840s, and then by nearly twenty-fold in the 1850s. The European and African populations differed not only racially and in being free and unfree, respectively, but also culturally in at least two different senses. In addition to the differences between cultures brought over from Europe and those brought over from Africa, these cultures differed in their survivability in the New World. Particular cultural groups from Europe tended to cluster together in highly localized communities throughout the Western Hemisphere, while Africans on a given plantation were often from culturally diverse areas of Africa and were forced by circumstances, as well as by the whites in charge, to acquire the language of the country in which they now found themselves. Because there were some common denominators among the cultures of West Africa, where most of the slaves in the Western Hemisphere originated, the cultural contrast between the situation of blacks and whites in the New World cannot be carried to extremes, but it was a contrast nonetheless. In some cases, a mixture of slaves speaking different languages and from different cultural backgrounds was deliberately chosen by slave owners as a strategy to reduce solidarity and the risk of conspiracies among the slaves. Slavery in the Western Hemisphere was largely plantation slavery, involving the routine drudgery of growing and harvesting a single crop, such as sugar in the tropics or cotton in the southern United States. Other crops were grown and other tasks had to be performed besides those of the plantation field hands, but the routine, unskilled labor of the field was the primary task of Africans in the New World. Thus, they entered Western civilization at the bottom, acquiring only the rudiments of that culture, such as the spoken language and familiarity with the simplest technology. To varying degrees, they lost the culture they brought over from Africa without acquiring the full range of European culture. The most extreme examples of this pattern were the blacks in the United States. From as early as the 17th century, most Negroes in the American colonies were born on American soil. This was the only plantation society in the Western Hemisphere in which the African population consistently maintained its numbers without continual large-scale importations of slaves from Africa, and in which this population grew by natural increase. By contrast, Brazil, over the centuries, imported six times as many slaves as the United States, even though the U.S. had a larger resident slave population than Brazil. Thirty-six percent of all the slaves in the Western Hemisphere 
as compared to 31% for Brazil. Even such Caribbean islands as Haiti, Jamaica, and Cuba each imported more slaves than the United States. The net result was that more of the African culture survived in other slave societies, where that culture was continually replenished by new arrivals. African languages, for example, were still being spoken in Brazil at least as late as the end of the 18th century. The influence of African music survived throughout the Western Hemisphere, even in the United States, where American Negroes evolved new musical forms from it that became a central part of American popular music in general. The exceptional nature of the American experience is related in part, and perhaps principally, to the geographical distance of the United States from Africa, which made the U.S. the farthest removed of all the plantation slave societies in the Western Hemisphere. It was much easier for Brazil to transport new slaves from Africa than for the United States to do so, the U.S. being so much farther from the source of supply. A slave in the United States in the mid-nineteenth century cost thirty times what he cost on the coast of Africa. American slave owners were very reluctant to lose this kind of investment, so much so that they often hired Irish immigrants to do work considered too dangerous for slaves. Likewise, infant mortality rates among slaves in the antebellum South were a fraction of what they were in the West Indies, much less what they were in countries closer to Africa. In the Caribbean and in Brazil, it was considered to be cheaper to buy new slaves from Africa than to raise local slaves from infancy to working age. This approach meant, among other things, importing more men than women, working slaves harder, even if this reduced their lifespan, and paying less attention to the needs of pregnant women or newborn babies. The much higher mortality rates among slaves in the Caribbean and Latin America reflected these patterns. Brazilian slaves had a declining lifespan, and Jamaica's slave population had a rate of natural decrease ranging from 1.5% to 3.7% annually during the 18th century. Although much has been made of the fact that Latin slave societies tended to have laws more protective of the slave as a human being than the laws of Anglo-American societies, laws were largely ineffective against slave owners throughout the Western Hemisphere. Even the death of a slave from overwork or from brutal whippings was likely to go unpunished. The more fundamental differences in the treatment of slaves were between those societies which could readily and economically replenish their supply from Africa and those which could not. The society least able to do this, the United States, better preserved the lives of existing slaves and paid more attention to pregnant slave women and their newborn babies. Only after the British ban on the international slave trade in 1808 made replacements from Africa less available did the slave population of Barbados begin to reproduce itself, and that of Jamaica began to approach that condition only in the waning years of slavery there. The general demographic makeup of different societies in the Western Hemisphere was likewise reflected in their racial policies. Where the African ancestry population, slave and free, vastly outnumbered the European ancestry population, whether in Latin America or in British colonies like Jamaica, the legal and social gap between slaves and free blacks tended to be widened, and elaborate racial gradations among free persons of color were recognized and different rights assigned to each, all with the effect of fragmenting the African ancestry population in a divide-and-conquer pattern. Where the Europeans were clearly powerful enough to suppress all the African ancestry population, as in Canada and in the American South, then a sharp black-and-white dichotomy was maintained in law and practice. In turn, this meant that internal color differences among the African ancestry populations of the Western Hemisphere tended to make a greater social difference to the Negroes themselves in Latin America and the Caribbean than in the United States. One consequence of these regional differences in the treatment of different segments of the African ancestry populations were differences in racial solidarity among these geographic regions. For example, it was much more common for free persons of color to own slaves in Latin America and the Caribbean than in the United States. The prime exception in the U.S. was New Orleans, a former Latin American colony acquired in the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, where there was a large class of Negroes owning slaves, 
one-third of the free colored families in New Orleans owned slaves, and 3,000 free persons of color joined the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Charleston, South Carolina, another exception, had many slave-owning free persons of color from the British West Indies and Santo Domingo. Elsewhere in the United States, where blacks owned other blacks as slaves, it was often only nominal ownership of members of their own family, given the high legal costs of obtaining freedom papers. Some whites, especially Quakers, also held nominal slaves for similar reasons, while those technically in bondage, in fact, lived the lives of free persons. Demography affected the development of Africans in the Western Hemisphere in other ways. Where a rough cross-section of European society was planted to the Western Hemisphere, both men and women, with widely varying skills and spread over a wide range of social and economic levels, there it was possible to confine Africans and their descendants to a narrow range of low-level occupations and roles. This was essentially the situation in the United States. But, where a predominantly male group of conquerors and settlers took control of a Western Hemisphere colony, then many more occupations, including those of skilled artisans, had to be filled by non-whites, and sexual liaisons developed with women of both African and Aboriginal ancestry, leading to whole classes of mixed ancestry people, both free and enslaved. This was the situation in much of Latin America and in the Caribbean colonies of various European nations. The proportion of the African ancestry population that was free varied greatly from society to society in the Western Hemisphere. In Jamaica, for example, less than one-tenth of the Negroes were free in the 18th century, and this proportion grew to only 11 percent on the eve of emancipation in 1834. In Barbados, the slaves outnumbered the free Negroes even more so. Yet in the Spanish colonies it became common for the free persons of color to outnumber the slaves in Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and Puerto Rico, for example, and for Spanish America as a whole, though not in Cuba until the late nineteenth century. However, in much of Spanish America, slavery itself was not a large-scale institution, nor Negroes a significant proportion of the population. In the Portuguese colony of Brazil, where slavery was indeed a major institution, the free-colored outnumbered slaves in some provinces, but not all. In the French colony of Martinique, slaves outnumbered free persons of color, but in another French colony, Santo Domingo, it was just the reverse. While freedom and slavery are a stark dichotomy, in many Western Hemisphere societies there were in fact important gradations of freedom on a continuum between these polar extremes. The plantation field hand, working under the direct threat of the lash, was at one end of this continuum. Domestic slaves in general, and urban slaves in particular, had some respite from the worst oppressions of slavery, as well as opportunities to become familiar with European culture at a somewhat higher level. They could, for example, hear the language of the country as spoken by a higher class of people, rather than as spoken by semi-literate white overseers. Some domestic slaves could surreptitiously learn to read and write, though literacy was expressly forbidden to slaves in Western Hemisphere societies. Urban slaves, on their own, often found employers to work for, giving part of their pay to their owners in exchange for the privilege of living virtually as free persons. Finally, the free person of color was not fully free, being subjected to many petty and sometimes humiliating legal requirements which did not apply to whites. While slave populations in the Western Hemisphere were often more male than female, especially on the sugar plantations in the tropics, the free persons of color were more female than male throughout the hemisphere. This reflected a tendency of women to be set free more readily than men, often after bearing a child by a slave owner or overseer. Thus, free persons of color tended to differ from the enslaved African population, not only in legal status, but also in skin color, cultural exposure, and sex ratios. Plantation field hands were the least likely to be freed or to escape successfully. House servants, urban slaves, or skilled artisans among the slaves were more likely to be able to earn money or the gratitude of whites, or to form personal ties across racial lines, all of which could be useful in ultimately gaining freedom. Moreover, existing slaves of mixed ancestry were more likely to be given such coveted jobs, 
Some of the more privileged ones were sometimes only nominally in bondage. Blanche K. Bruce, who was later to become the first Negro senator in the Reconstruction era, was in childhood tutored alongside his white master's son, or other son, according to those who suspected that his master was also his father. Nominal slaves were not uncommon, nor was it uncommon for them to be mulattoes. In Antebellum Savannah, for example, two of the churches in the free Negro community were headed by ministers who were among the most prosperous members of that community, even though they were, legally speaking, slaves. The extent to which the free persons of color were of mixed ancestry varied from society to society, but it tended always to be greater than the extent to which slaves were of mixed ancestry. In the United States, 37% of the free Negroes were officially classified as mulattoes, compared to only 8% among the slaves. This did not mean that all other Negroes were of unmixed African ancestry, for the term mulatto was often used narrowly in the United States to mean half-white or more, omitting many other people of mixed African and European ancestries. But whatever the term mulatto meant in different countries, it applied far more often to the free Negroes than to those in bondage. In Brazil, for example, the great majority of free Negroes were mulattoes, and the great majority of the slaves were black. More than half of the free persons of color in Barbados and Suriname were also mulattoes. Mulattoes commonly had a higher official status in slave societies of the Western Hemisphere, except in the United States, where the black-white dichotomy was what mattered in law and practice, though even in the United States there were informal advantages for mulattoes. Some free persons of color prospered, and, especially in Latin America, passed into the white population, but most did neither. Nevertheless, however modest the achievements of most free Negroes, they had a very sizable head start over enslaved blacks in literacy, acculturation, and experience as free people responsible for managing their own lives. In addition, they were more likely to have skills, money, or connections, even if on a modest scale. Education and acculturation in general spread very unevenly among American Negroes, first reaching the house servants and later the field hands, first the free and then the slaves, first the mulattoes and then the blacks. These large historic social disparities within the African origin population of the United States were reflected in the fact that some American Negroes graduated from college before slavery was abolished while Negroes in the United States as a whole averaged no more than a sixth-grade education as late as 1940. In the middle of the twentieth century, most of the Negro professionals in Washington, D.C., were by all indications descendants of the antebellum free persons of color, a group that was never more than 14 percent of the American Negro population. Social, economic, and cultural disparities within the African ancestry population of the Western Hemisphere were also reflected in a social separation that took generations, or even centuries, to erode. In Peru, as early as the seventeenth century, locally-born Negroes worshipped separately from African-born Negroes, and then even the locally-born separated again into mulatto and black congregations. Throughout the era of slavery, Free mulattoes in the Western Hemisphere tended to distance themselves socially from blacks, both slave and free. Although such openly acknowledged color consciousness was not as common in the African ancestry population of the United States as in South America and the Caribbean, nevertheless the elite among American Negroes tended to remain, for generations after emancipation, a distinctly lighter complexioned and socially exclusive group. In 19th-century Philadelphia, for example, 85% of mulatto men married mulatto women, and 93% of black men married black women. Moreover, even when mulatto women married black men, these were usually black men in the top occupations among people of African ancestry. Conversely, when black women married mulatto men, as fewer than 3% of black women did, these mulatto men were more often from the bottom occupational categories. Both patterns reflected the superior social status accorded to lighter-skinned people within the Negro community. More than skin color differences were involved, however. Crime rates were higher and housing poorer in the black neighborhoods than in the mulatto neighborhoods, and a smaller percentage of black children attended schools than was the case among mulatto children. 
a larger proportion of mulattoes worked in higher-level occupations and averaged larger amounts of wealth. Philadelphia was not unique in any of these respects. In antebellum Savannah, for example, the most prosperous individuals among the free persons of color were mulattoes, and these tended to marry other mulattoes, rather than the darker members of the free Negro population. Marriages between slave and free Negroes were more common in Savannah than marriages between mulattoes and blacks. For generations to come, all across the country, north and south, the elite of the American Negro community tended to be lighter in complexion than the masses, and to be very self-conscious and sometimes snobbish about that fact. They, as well as whites, often attributed their success to Caucasian genes, rather than to historical circumstances and cultural opportunities. Underlying these social phenomena was an economically very consequential transfer of valuable human capital, varying according to prior social and biological relationships with the white population from which this human capital came. In New Orleans during the Reconstruction era after the Civil War, 91% of Negro politicians were mulattoes, in some cases more accurately described as quadroons or octoroons, people with only one-fourth or one-eighth African ancestry. When light-skinned and dark-skinned Negro soldiers were separated for mental testing in one of the U.S. Army camps during the First World War, the darker Negroes turned out to have higher rates of illiteracy and the lighter-skinned Negroes to score higher on mental tests. Nor was this an isolated result. A comprehensive survey of mental test results among American Negroes found that those of visibly mixed ancestry tended to score higher than those of apparently unmixed African ancestry. This correlation between skin color and other social qualities was not merely a perception or an arbitrary stereotype, but a fact. That this fact may be explained historically by one group's earlier and better access to higher levels of European culture, rather than by genetics, did not prevent it from being a fact nevertheless. Very real behavioral differences, as well as snobbery and vanity, underlay a tendency of the more fortunate and lighter-skinned segment of the African ancestry population to separate itself from the black masses. Such differences within the African ancestry population were not limited to the United States, nor had such differences disappeared entirely by the late twentieth century. In Brazil, as late as 1980, blacks and browns were almost as residentially segregated from one another in Brazilian cities as blacks were from whites, and more so than browns from whites. While the degree of urban residential segregation in general was not as great in Brazil as in the contemporary United States, the historic differences within the African ancestry population of Brazil were similar and similarly persistent, not only as regards residential patterns, but also as regards marriage patterns. As with other groups around the world, historic head starts have had enduring consequences. Long after general emancipation erased the legal distinction between free persons of color and the masses of blacks, their respective descendants continued to show large gaps in achievement. For example, it would be 1900 before the Negro population of the United States as a whole reached the level of literacy achieved by the free persons of color in 1850, and it was 1940 before American Negroes as a group would be as urbanized as the free persons of color were in the middle of the 19th century.